we are going to discuss on the last type of microcytic anemia in this video that is thalassemia so this itself needs a separate discussion per se because this is really a huge topic because you have to understand a lot of genetics behind this thalassemia that's why so if you ask about the why thalassemia causes microcytic anemia again we go back to the basics the reason is I told you because of reduced globin synthesis. Again, the same thing which we have discussed innumerable times, heme and globin is going to result in something called hemoglobin. I already told you either heme synthesis reduction or if there is reduction in the globin, globin chain synthesis, your net effect is going to be reduced hemoglobin in the cytosol. If your hemoglobin production in the cytosol is reduced, you are going to result in a microcytic anemia. So thalassemia comes under this area where the globin chain synthesis will be reduced. Because of that you will have a reduced hemoglobin synthesis and you will have something called a microcytic anemia. So that is the reason. So anyway, so knowing the basics and uh, going to you know, like in depth is always important. So once you move on from this, the most important thing to understand thalassemia is the you know, like basic differences between an alpha and a beta thalassemia. So what is going to be an alpha thalassemia and what is going to be the difference in a beta thalassemia? So in alpha thalassemia, the problem is the pro I mean, synthesis of the alpha chains and beta thalassemia, the problem is synthesis of the beta chains. You know that. We are not going to discuss anything more than that. But what are the, I mean, in general, what are the basic differences? First thing, if you ask me about the geographical differences, alpha thalassemia is very common in the Southeast Asia and Africa, geography-wise, whereas Beta thalassemia is also very uh, common in the Mediterranean regions. That is the reason why beta thalassemias are also referred to as something called a Mediterranean anemia. Then you have something called a genetics. Genetics generally alpha thalassemia is due to gene deletions. Alpha thalassemia is due to gene deletions very commonly. But there are a lot of other types, I mean other uh, genetic reasons why you get an alpha thalassemia as well. But gene deletions are the classical and the most common. But if you ask me about beta thalassemia, they are generally due to point mutations or frame shift mutations. So that is the reason why you get a beta thalassemia commonly. Then whether they can present in fetal life or not. Fetal life can they present. I am not telling all thalassemias present in fetal life. But if few do present in fetal life. But if they do present, can alpha thalassemia present in fetal life? Yes, certain types. Especially only one thing that will present in fetal life is that alpha, I mean for all four gene deletion of alpha thalassemia which we will discuss in some time. So but yes still it can present. But if you ask me whether beta thalassemia can present in fetal life or not, answer is no. They can't present in fetal life, absolutely not possible. The reason why they can't present in fetal life is because you know there are two hemoglobins. In fetal life what you need is HBF in fetal life and you need HBA in adult life. If you ask me what do you mean by HBF, it will be alpha 2 and gamma 2 chains. If you ask me what about your uh, HBA, it is nothing but alpha 2 and beta 2 chains. So this is what we call adult hemoglobin HBA. But one thing you can commonly notice is that both HBF as well as HBA needs alpha chains. So which means alpha thalassemia if it's sufficiently severe enough it can cause problems in both fetus as well as adult but your HPA since you know like your beta chains are formed only in adult life it is not important in fetal life in fetal life your beta chains are not important which means your initially the gamma chains will be the one that is pronounced alpha will be there in both adult as well as fetus this gamma becoming beta is complete by around six months of by around, I mean, 30 weeks of postnatal life. That is around 6 months of postnatal period. That is approximately 6 months postnatal or 30 weeks postnatal. That is the time where your uh, gamma chain shift to beta chain will happen. That is, the that is the time where your HBF will be completely taken over by HBA. So that is the idea. So that is the reason why alpha thalassemias can happen in fetus as well as adult life. But beta thalassemias can happen only after birth. That is it can happen only six months after your child is born. So that then only you can have a clinical manifestations from a beta thalassemia. So that is a very important thing to understand. But uh, before that what is the problem in this alpha and beta thalassemia? What is the pathophysiology in alpha and beta thalassemia? What could be the reasons for why you get an alpha and beta thalassemia? 
I mean reasons for the clinical manifestations. The reason is very simple. Suppose if you take an, it's a overproduction of, I mean it's the, I mean relative excess of the other normal chain that is being produced. For example, if you take an alpha thalassemia, the alpha chains are reduced in number. Whereas beta chains are normal, which means even though it is normal in this context, it's relatively increased. So which means the beta chains tend to precipitate and they are going to result in something called erythrocyte instability. They are going to result in something called erythrocyte instability, which will result in hemolysis and ineffective erythropoiesis. Hemolysis and ineffective erythropoiesis. So that's what is going to result from this. If you have a beta thalassemia for that matters, what you're going to get is your alpha chains will be normal, but the beta chain production will be significantly decreased, which means here your alpha chains are in relative excess. So this alpha chains can precipitate. Here the beta chains are precipitating, but here the alpha chains are precipitating in a beta thalassemia. Because of that same reason, you will get erythrocyte instability and ineffective erythropoiesis and anemia because of that. So which means in both alpha and beta thalassemia, the problem is in the relative excess of the normal chain. Relative excess of normally produced chains. That is the problem. So that is the reason why you get the erythrocyte instability and hemolysis. That is also one reason. For example, if you take a beta thalassemia, if you have an associated alpha gene deletion, for example, if alpha is also decreased in a patient with a beta thalassemia, so the patient is having already a beta thalassemia, the patient is having associated alpha gene, alpha gene deletions. I said alpha gene deletions. What you are actually doing is you are balancing the alpha beta ratio, which means you are putting the ratio of, of approximately you are making the ratio to one. So which means this might result in less severity, which means coexistence of alpha gene deletion or an alpha thalassemia with the beta thalassemia is actually beneficial. I mean, even though, you know, like you might think it's not good, beta and alpha both together. No, it's actually good because the instability will reduce because the chain imbalance will reduce if they both coexist together. That is also one reason why you have to understand because in the future I'm going to discuss about those things also. So now this is the pathophysiology of alpha and beta thalassemia. Once you have noted about the path pathophysiology, pathogenesis of alpha and beta thalassemia, you have to know about the classification. So how can you classify alpha and beta thalassemia? So classification wise, if you ask about alpha and beta thalassemia, I can do two things. One is the clinical classification and second is the genetic classification. If you ask me about the clinical classification, clinically there are three types. One is severe forms and second one you have something called intermediate forms and third one you have something called mild forms or minor forms. That's what we call. Severe forms, there are only two types. In an alpha thalassemia, there is a disease called hydrops fetalis. Hydrops fetalis. Typically, this, I mean, we are going to discuss in detail about all these things in the genetic classification, but still, I am just giving an overview. Where the fetus will die at the fetal life itself, which means it's a death in utero. It's not going to survive. It's not going to see the world in any, any way. So, this is what we refer to as death in utero. This is generally due to the four, all four alpha gene deletions. Only four genes are there totally in a human being. So all four genes are related. You will result in this fatal condition. The second one in a beta thalassemia, you have something called a thalassemia major. Thalassemia major. So this is otherwise referred to as something called a Coolies anemia. Coolies anemia. So what do you mean by uh, thalassemia major? The moment you call it thalassemia major, we call this as actually transfusion dependent thalassemia or is it a TDT or otherwise you can call it as a transfusion dependent thalassemia which means in this patients the anemia is so severe that the patients need lifelong transfusions regular transfusions throughout their life otherwise they won't survive so that's why this is what also referred to as something called a transfusion dependent thalassemia this transfusion dependency is the key to diagnose this thalassemia major clinically so this is the key so without this, you cannot diagnose a thalassemia major. That is the key for, uh, I mean, um, branding a patient as a thalassemia major. Otherwise, you can't tell the patient as a thalassemia major. So intermediate, only one thing is there. Typically, we tend to call them as something called a thalassemia intermedia. 
thalassemia intermedia. So what do you mean by thalassemia intermedia? So there are a lot of overlaps between the thalassemia major and the thalassemia intermedia. If you ask me, there will be too much of overlap in the clinical features. Overlap in the clinical features will be there. So there are a lot of things which are more common in thalassemia major than thalassemia intermedia. There are a lot of things which are more common in thalassemia intermedia than thalassemia major. But what differentiates intermedia from major? Which means the clinical features can't differentiate. Which means whatever clinical features I'm going to tell in the future can be seen in both thalassemia major as well as thalassemia intermedia. So we can't differentiate based on the clinical features. But what typically differentiates is thalassemia intermedia is non-transfusion dependent thalassemia. Which means they are not dependent on any regular transfusion. So which means you don't need any regular transfusion in this patient. Which means their anemia is not that severe. At the same time, they tend to manage with uh, occasional transfusions only. Which means occasionally, when, whenever the patient is going for some stressful conditions like surgery, pregnancy, and all these conditions, you might need transfusions. Apart from that, you don't need regular transfusions. But whereas in a thalassemia major, these patients need regular transfusions and they are completely transfusion dependent. So that is the reason why this is very important to understand. And the moment you go about the mild forms or minor forms, Typically, these milder forms, we tend to call it as something called thalassemia minor or a thalassemia trait. So whenever you call a thalassemia minor or thalassemia trait, first of all, the patient will not have any clinical feature and the patient will be completely asymptomatic. No clinical features of thalassemia will be there. The patient will be completely asymptomatic. There can be some laboratory abnormalities. For example, the patient may have increased RBC count, very common especially in a beta thalassemia minor, increased RBC count, patient will have microcytic hypochromic anemia. They have, I mean, very reasonable microcytes will be there, but RBC count may be increased. In all these settings, these are some of the examples, but apart from that, you can't, very difficult to diagnose a thalassemia minor. Uh, for example, in thalassemia minor or you can diagnose an HB electrophoresis. Remember, HB electrophoresis is very important in diagnosing a thalassemia minor, especially a beta thalassemia minor. If you want to diagnose a beta thalassemia minor, your uh, HB electrophores will be useful where HbA2 will be uh, more than 3.5 percentage. This is the trademark for a beta thalassemia minor to be diagnosed in HB electrophores. But whereas if you take an alpha thalassemia minor, the HB electrophores can be completely normal. So your alpha thalassemias cannot be diagnosed by HB electrophores also. So it's very difficult to diagnose. Based on genetic mutation analysis only you can diagnose, otherwise it's very difficult to diagnose. But whereas in a major and an intermedia, always HB electrophoresis will be abnormal. You will have some findings which I will tell you in some time what are the findings you will get in general. So these are some of the things you have to understand. First, thalassemia major, thalassemia intermedia, clinical features are overlap, but what differentiates them is the transfusion dependency. Major is transfusion dependent, whereas minor is not transfusion dependent. Whereas minor, the patient will not have any clinical features at all in the first place. They are completely asymptomatic. Only some hematological parameters may be help, helping you to diagnose a minor or a trait. So otherwise it is very difficult to diagnose a minor or a trait. So we have some uh, additional things also, laboratory around in the sense, so for example, the beta thalassemia minor, which I am I'm only telling an overview now, beta thalassemia minor can be diagnosed by two important indices. One is called Menzer's index, again one we have something called Nestroft, that's called naked eye, single tube, red cell, osmotic fragility test. So you can diagnose by any of these methods, which you are anyway going to discuss in the subsequent minutes. So these are the clinical classification, major, intermediate and minor, completely clinical. I have not told anything about, you know, like your laboratory parameters as such till now. So now when we go for the genetic classification, and one more thing I didn't tell you, where I told you severe forms you can get with alpha as well as beta thalassemia. Intermediate forms also you can get with alpha and beta thalassemia. Mild forms also you can get with an alpha as well as beta thalassemia. Which means it's not like you will get only severe forms with beta, mild forms with alpha, nothing like that. Anything can produce any kind of, um, you know, like picture in the clinical presentation. So clinical presentation will only tell you the patient might be having a thalassemia and whether it is severe, mild or intermediate. But what is underlying? problem whether it's alpha or beta can be diagnosed only based on your laboratory parameters which i'll tell you in some time so if you ask me about the genetic classification of thalassemia whenever you ask about genetic classification of thalassemia before understanding genetic classification of thalassemia you have to know what do you mean by homozygous what do you mean by heterozygous and what do you mean by compound heterozygous so first let me tell about what do you mean by homozygous 
the moment you call about homozygous means first thing you have to tell what is an allele an allele is a combination of two things one genes that come from the mom so which means i can write gene here and put an s here which means which means for a particular trait we are talking about a particular trait uh, for a particular trait or a particular character for example blue eye is a character you might have multiple genes for a blue eye character so trait is what we equate to an allele not the genes if it's a particular single gene causing the blue eye that single gene you can call it as a trait and single gene can be equated to an allele also so in general allele means a trait i mean there might be multiple genes that uh, giving rise to a particular trait and hence a particular allele so you can't really tell that only one gene is responsible for one allele so that is the basic difference between allele and a gene so you have gene from the mom and you have a gene from the dad so or you can write something called genes also you can call from the dad so both together gives rise to a particular allele and that particular allele forms a particular trait so that particular allele gives rise to a particular trait and this is what happened this is what is happening suppose uh, this could this gene could be single or even cluster a lot of genes could be there two or more genes also could be there similarly dad's genes could be a single gene or even a cluster of a gene for example best example for a single gene forming you know like mom and dad's is beta beta you have only one gene inherited from both the parents it means only two beta genes are there but if you ask me about alpha genes there are two alpha genes inherited from mom and dad so two from mom and two from dad so that is completely different so it could be anything so this is the basic difference between allele and a, uh, you know like gene and a trait and all these things you have to understand so the moment i call about homozygous means you have same mutation in both dad as well as the mom so which means you are going to have the same mutation in dad allele as well as the your uh, mom allele so mom allele and the dad allele both are going to produce same mutation so i can write alleles here sorry for that so alleles it's not a single allele Obvi obviously alleles will be two so particular character comes from both the father as well as the mother so alleles so two alleles are there so your mom gene or allele is also mutated and your dad's gene or allele is also mutated and the mutation is the same in both mom as well as the dad you have the same mutation same mutation in paternal as well as maternal allele paternal as well as maternal allele remember the allele may be single or it may be a cluster of genes so in i mean uh, simplistic terms you can equate this allele to a gene also you can remember like same mutation seen in both the genes so in this condition this is what we call it as homozygous i'll tell you the examples the moment you call heterozygous what do you mean by heterozygous heterozygous means you are having mom's gene you are having dad's gene or allele and one is mutated and the other one is completely normal which means this is what we clinically refer to as something called heterozygous so which means one is mutated one is normal that's what we call heterozygous and what do you mean by a compound heterozygous compound heterozygous the moment you call it as a compound heterozygous means you have a mom and you have a dad gene for example let us assume the dad's allele or genes are mutated and the mom's allele or genes are also mutated but why i put different color one in pink and one in uh, green is both are completely different mutations they are not the same both are completely different mutation this is what we refer to as something called a compound heterozygous mutation or a compound heterozygous variant so classic example if you ask me a homozygous mutation i can tell you for example if you have a hb ss which means you know very well normal this is a classical homozygous mutation if you have a hb a typically the patient is having something called hb a which means both the i mean hemoglobin genes are made of hemoglobin a hemoglobin a into 
so which means both mom side the inherited hemoglobin a and uh, dad side the inherited hemoglobin a as well so this is a normal thing but in sickle cell disease you might inherit a i mean uh, from mom also you might inherit a sickle gene and from dad also you might inherit a sickle gene which means it's the same mutation happening so this is a typical example of a homozygous then what do you mean by heterozygous i can write something called hbas i'm going to call it as heterozygous which means we ask me from mom side for example it is hba that is normal i mean is the normal adult hemoglobin that is inherited which is a normal thing but on the other hand but if you see the dad side i mean it could be from the mom side also just for understanding i'm telling you from the dad side if you see they are inheriting hbs sickle hemoglobin so that is the reason why this is heterozygous one is normal one is mutated so but what is common heterozygous if i write an example called hbs beta so which means here you have both the genes mutated so from mom side you have inherited hbs and from dad side you have inherited again a mutated gene that is beta thalassemia so which means both are mutated but they are different mutation so this is what we refer to something called a compound heterozygote so with this understanding this is a very basic thing to understand about the i mean thalassemia genetics because why it is very important to understand the beta globin chain genetics because i told you already in the last video it is one of the first um you know like genes to be i mean you are to see in a human genome project to delineate delineated by humans and that is the reason each and every nucleotide was sequenced in a you know like beta globin gene for the first time so that is the reason why this beta globin gene has been so important in all the genetic books that is the first mark where we have started understanding how a gene works what is a promoter and what is you know like uh, transcription facilitators and all these things we have tata box everything we have understood by beta globin gene analysis only this post translation modifications mrna splicing everything we have literally analyzed understood from beta globin gene for the first time so that is the reason why this is important to understand in the first place so once you have known about all this factors so let us move on to the real genetic classification first one uh, let us discuss about the alpha thalassemia so let me put the small table a homozygous here let me put a heterozygotes here so you have alpha thalassemia for that matters and again alpha thalassemia you can have two types of alpha thalassemias one is called alpha 0 and second one is called alpha plus so what do you mean by alpha 0 alpha 0 means i am talking only about one particular allele so one allele means alpha 0 one allele but alpha 0 means for example you know one particular allele contains two genes isn't it so two alpha genes alpha 0 means both are abnormal which means both are deleted so that absolutely no alpha chain synthesis is possible from that particular allele i'm not talking about both the alleles from that particular allele or from that particular gene cluster or a gene no alpha chain synthesis happens or no alpha chain synthesis is possible which means since alpha thalassemia is mostly due to gene deletions the only way to get this is both the alpha genes from that particular allele should be deleted i told you one particular allele of alpha chain has two alpha genes and you inherit two from mom and two from dad so you have four alpha genes so one particular allele means from mom means two alpha genes you are inheriting if that particular allele should not work at all means the entire both alpha genes from one particular parent should be deleted then only you will be resulting in alpha zero uh, type of a particular allele so suppose if it's alpha plus means there is synthesis of some alpha chains some alpha chains in this still happens which means to get that since alpha i mean uh, thalassemia is due to gene deletions to get that if you take this is the mom allele typically only one will be deleted and one will be completely normal so i mean this and i'm not talking about heterozygous heterozygous means only when you go to the next dad allele also then only whether it's normal or not then only you can call it heterozygous but if you have in the same allele to get some alpha chain synthesis only one should be deleted and other should be normal then only you can get from that particular allele you can it's mutated that allele is mutated but still that genes are mutated but still some alpha chain synthesis is still possible from the mutated allele from a mom or a dad any one so this is what we call alpha plus so when you call alpha zero homozygous what it means so which means both mom and dad which means 
mom also should have alpha 0 dad also should have alpha 0 so which means you are inheriting both no change in this from both the alleles so how, what is this possible which means you are inheriting two gene from mom deleted two gene from mom which is deleted at the same time inheriting two alpha genes from dad that are also deleted which means you can indirectly write this as four gene deletions that's what is going to happen so this four gene deletions is the result of homozygous alpha zero the moment you got homozygous alpha zero means alpha zero alpha zero means all four genes are deleted both the genes from mom also deleted alpha zero both the genes from dad also deleted that is also alpha zero so alpha no alpha chain at all so this is what we call four gene deletion how they are going to present this four gene deletion i already told you they are going to present death in utero which means very severe form the reason for this is i told you in the fetus one hemoglobin is very important that is called something called a hemoglobin f and if hemoglobin f contains alpha chain and gamma chain I already told you any chain alpha beta or alpha gamma both these things should be in balance and exactly equal to one and the cell regulates very nicely all these things so but in this condition since there is absolutely no alpha chain at all there will be only gamma chains will be produced and these gamma chains can tetramerize and they can produce something called gamma 4 tetramers and this gamma 4 tetramers is what we are going to call it as something called hemoglobin bots and the problem with this hemoglobin bots is because this is only made of gamma chain remember gamma chains are the ones that give that characteristic high affinity of oxygen to the hemoglobin f why alpha i mean hemoglobin a is having lesser affinity in comparison with hemoglobin f because we saw in the hemoglobin oxygen dissociation curve odc curves also where hbf itself will shift the hemoglobin curve i mean odc towards the left because it increases the affinity for the oxygen the reason for hbf having increased affinity for the oxygen is the gamma chains alpha and gamma the gamma is the reason but if you all the four chains are made of gamma then definitely you are going to result in something called very very high affinity because they are not going to release oxygen at all so very high affinity very much increased oxygen affinity which means the tissues will go for hypoxia which means they are not going to release oxygen at all in the tissues because they go for severe hypoxia of the tissues they may go for something called high out i mean high output cardiac failure severe anemia and they may go for high drops high drops fetalis that is the reason why they die in utero so they can go for something called high drops fetalis that is because there's something called high output cardiac failure because of severe anemia two reasons this gamma foot tetramers can itself cause erythrocyte instability and hemolysis hemolysis and erythrocyte instability both can be produced by this gamma foot tetramers at the same time this also has very high oxygen affinity which does not release hemoglobin at all in the peripheral tissue so which means it can result in severe hypoxia high output cardiac failure and high drop so that is what is going to happen in al al i mean uh, homozygous alpha zero then come to the alpha zero heterozygous variant so what do you mean by alpha zero heterozygous which means one is alpha zero another one is normal which means you know very well one should be normal and one should be mutated that's what is happening the mutated one is alpha zero we have already told then only you can call it as heterozygous this is the definition of heterozygous one normal one mutated but the mutated here we are giving a condition that is alpha zero so which means in this context you can write it as alpha zero means no alpha genes in that but alpha genes in that particular l both are deleted at the same time here it is normal which means two alpha genes are normally there clear so in this condition how they are going to present is this heterozygous which means this can i can also result uh, write as something called two gene deletions the moment i write as two gene deletions they are going to be completely asymptomatic and they are going to be present as thalassemia minor or a trait which i discussed in the clinical classification already they are going to present as thalassemia minor or trait and again very important thing is hemoglobin electrophoresis tends to be normal also hemoglobin electrophoresis tend to be normal in these patients also why i am telling that point very importantly because beta thalassemia trait or minor will have hba to more than 3.5 a very classic hemoglobin electrophoresis abnormality but here you're not going to have any kind of hemoglobin electrophoresis abnormality so this is two gene deletion if you ask about alpha plus alpha plus and if the patient is homozygous what will result so which means homozygous means both are mutated and we are giving a condition both should be alpha plus both alleles should be mutated alpha plus means i already told you only one will be deleted one must be normal 
Similarly, alpha plus means only one gene will be deleted, other must be normal. But you can see both the alleles are some way it is mutated. So both are mutated, so that's why it's homozygous. But if you want to develop alpha plus, one alpha gene in that particular allelic cluster at least must be normal. Then only you can result in alpha plus. Homozygous means both are alpha plus. So which means it's again similar to something called two gene deletions. And again, it's going to result in the same picture like the patients will be completely asymptomatic. They might have a slightly elevated RBC count and a microcytic anemia, but apart from that, HB electrophoresis also will be normal. Only genetic analysis can diagnose this, like similar to other uh, heterozygous alpha-0, where I have seen another two gene deletion, it's going to mimic the same way. So, which means both are going to present in the same condition only. They are not, not going to be any different. So, finally, you have something called a heterozygous alpha plus. So, what do you mean by heterozygous alpha plus? If you want to know about heterozygous alpha plus, which means one is alpha plus and another is alpha, which means one is normal and another is mutated. This is what we call heterozygous. But in the mutated, we have given a condition called alpha plus, which means in this one alpha should at least be normal, then only you can get a, uh, some alpha genes in this alpha plus and the other one must be completely normal, which means it is technically equal to one alpha gene deletion. If you ask me one alpha gene deletion, how they will present is typically in a way called a silent carrier state. This is what we refer to as something called a silent carrier. What do you mean by a silent carrier? Silent carrier means peripheral smear normal, hemoglobin electrophoresis normal, completely asymptomatic, which means you can't diagnose by any hematological or clinical parameters. Not possible. Everything in this patient will be normal, including peripheral smear. At least in minor or a trait, you had a some element of microcytosis and increased RBC counter all. But in this condition, you will not have any abnormality in the peripheral smear or laboratory parameters. The only way to find this is in the genetic testing. Apart from that, you can't find. Maybe you can, because you cannot do all this thing in all patients, isn't it? Because everyone will be asymptomatic and how can you suspect? Only in patients of already thalassemic patients or already having alpha thalassemia known cases, their children, if they are having, I mean, can be screened for this asymptomatic silent carrier because they might transmit the disease in the future to some of their progenies. That is the reason in those conditions you can test for this mutation. Otherwise, there is no point in testing in these asymptomatic patients. So these are the importance about this alpha thalassemia I told you. But we have seen four gene deletions. We have seen two gene deletions. We have seen one gene deletion also. But we have not yet seen this characteristic three gene deletion. We have not yet characteristic seen this 3-gene deletion. So what do you mean by 3-gene deletion? 3-gene deletion typically results from a compound heterozygous mutation. This again it comes in here. This is a compound heterozygous mutation. So what do you mean by a compound heterozygous mutation? If you ask me what do you mean by compound heterozygous? Uh, the first one is like uh, you, have, you should have a mutation. For example, one is alpha 0 and another is alpha plus, which means from one allele you have no alpha genes in this from another allele if you have a, some alpha genes in this this is actually both moms and dad allele are mutated but both are showing different mutations so which means typically this i mean uh, characterizes this common heterozygous definition so alpha zero means no absolutely no alpha genes are there alpha plus means at least one alpha gene is somehow missed intact so this is what we refer to as this three gene deletion and this is going to result, this compound heterozygotes in alpha thalassemia, that is the three gene deletion, carelessly is going to result in a typical disease, something called as HBH disease. That is what we refer to as something called a hemoglobin H disease. So how this hemoglobin H disease is going to present? Hemoglobin H disease has problems during fetal life also, but it is not severe enough to kill the fetus. The fetus will be born alive, it's not unlike 4 gene deletions, 3 gene deletions will have affect the fetus but they won't die in utero, affect the fetus but no death in utero usually, no death in utero. At the same time, um, they will affect the children also, they will affect the newborns also, newborn and adults, newborn and adults at the same time. So both can be affected. That is the reason why you can diagnose this condition at birth, most of them. Remember, beta thalassemias never ever present at birth. One of the very important alpha thalassemias, as I told you, only alpha thalassemias can present at birth. And the only alpha thalassemia that present at birth is HBH disease. Very important. They present at birth itself. They will present at birth with usually anemia, 
usually typically in the range of 7 to 8 him cramps per deciliter some what moderate to severe anemia will be there at the same time patient will be having a uh, lot of other characteristic features of thalassemia intermedia features which we'll discuss in some time what could be the clinical features of thalassemia intermedia so typically this disease is going to present like a thalassemia intermedia which means these patients are completely non transfusion dependent thalassemia but they will have clinical features of thalassemia clinical features of thalassemia will be there that will be there but they are completely non transfusion dependent which means generally they present like a thalassemia intermedia and they present at birth itself they'll have splenomegaly all these things are very common at birth so why problem in the fetus because i told you in this condition alpha gamma this is important for fetal hemoglobin alpha beta ratio is important for adult life in both these conditions since alpha is significantly decreased in both these states this gamma and beta since it's relatively normal they can form something called gamma four tetramers during fetal life that is the reason why they have that anemia hemolysis and all in the fetal life itself but it's not manifesting as death that's all but still they do have this H, i mean hemoglobin bards formation that is this gamma four tetramers is what we are affecting as hemoglobin bards so this bards will be there that is the reason why they develop anemia at birth itself all this erythrocyte instability hemolysis and all will be there at birth itself at the same time why this disease gets prolonged uh, in adult life also is because this hemoglobin a also because of relative excess of this beta chains they are tend to form something called this beta 4 tetramers as the hemoglobin shift happens from hbf to hba they start producing instead of gamma 4 tetramers they will produce beta 4 tetramers again that is going to cause the continuing anemia continuing anemia erythrocyte instability and hemolysis that is due to beta 4 tetramers which will typically result in a hemoglobin called hemoglobin h very important this hemoglobin h is the one in the peripheral smear is going to call something called a golf ball cells we have already seen this in the rbc inclusions in the rbc basics we have seen this they are going to result in something called a classic inclusion body called as golf ball cells so if you just want to revise so what do you mean by a golf ball cell you can see one more time so this is where you have this typical golf ball cell where you can look like this dot dot inclusion bodies are hb h so these are hbh inclusion bodies and these cells are what we refer to as something called golf ball cells very important point so that's what you see these are hbh inclusions so very important and remember hbh inclusions can be stained only by supravital stain only by supravital stain supravital stains you cannot stain this hbh by normal romanowski stains this uh, gmsr right stains and all will not stain your hbh there are two things you can remember all inclusion bodies of the rbcs can be stained by can be stained by supravital stains everything can be stained by supravital stains every single inclusion body can stain with supravital stain but you have some important things what gms are right that is this romanowski stain gms are right stain is an example of a commonly used romanowski stain what gms are right can't stain what gms are right cannot stain is your uh, hinge body hinge bodies and hbh disease hbh so these are the two things that your routine stains can't stain very very important which means this hinge bodies and your hbh can be stained only by supravital stains but all the inclusion bodies can be stained with supravital stains similarly there are some special stains for prussian blue you stain ring de sideroblast we have seen already this is initially itself i have shown this is the ring de sideroblast this can be better stained with prussian blue similarly this papenheimer bodies are also better stained with pearls prussian blue stain apart from that every single uh, inclusion body can be stained with supravital stains like new methylene blue or uh, brilliant crystal blue but your hinge bodies and hbh can't be stained by your routine gms or stains which can be can be stained only by your supravital stains again very important point uh, again investigation wise this peripheral smear itself will give a clue and uh, genetic analysis is also there and uh, treatment wise if you ask me this three gene deletion that is this variant of alpha thalassemia 
treatment wise if you ask me they are generally need only occasional transfusions occasional transfusions which means only during crisis they need transfusions which means this is a feature of a thalassemia intermedia this is a feature of a thalassemia intermedia that's it so this is what is going to happen so we have seen about homozygous heterozygous common heterozygous also one gene two gene three gene four gene deletions everything we have seen but we have not seen a non deletional alpha thalassemia this is the final on alpha thalassemia there is something called a non deletional type of a alpha thalassemia the moment you call about this non deletional type of an alpha thalassemia so what do you mean by that non deletional type of alpha thalassemia means very simple that is the patient will have uh, some other thing apart from the gene deletions the most common thing and the simple and the best example for that is something called hemoglobin constant spring so that's what we call we call it as hb constant spring otherwise called as hemoglobin constant because it was first identifying in a caribbean region called constant spring that's why the name came from the geographical area where it was first discovered that's what we call constant spring so hemoglobin constant spring the moment you call it as hemoglobin constant spring or hb constant spring uh, what do you, what is the reason for that if you ask me normally you have an alpha gene for example if you have an alpha gene the moment you have an alpha gene you will have a promoter here in the beginning before the gene starts itself you will have a, something called a promoter sequence this is a common thing and uh, at the end of the exon you will have a lot of non coding regions also in between you have a lot of non coding regions these non coding regions are referred to as something called introns introns and you have a lot of coding regions this coding regions we call them as red put in blue these are the coding regions which give rise to the actual protein these are called as exons so i am telling just as an example so you have a lot of exon lot of introns and all these things and finally which will be terminated by a stop codon at the end and the, actually the things will continue after that i mean dna is something that is going to continue so stop codon it ends and where the trans transcription will start is here and it's going to end here which means it's going to start at this point which is going to give rise to introns exons exons introns and exons and finally stops here it has to stop here ultimately that's it which means the stop codon will tell you the mrna transcription should stop at this point so which means the transcription of the gene at this point will stop for example if you take this is the alpha chain mrna i am drawing only hypothetical not the exact alpha chain so this is an alpha chain mrna for that matters so what if your stop codon i mean because of some point mutation for example if you have an u a g which is an example of a stop codon instead there is a point mutation changes to u g g which means what is going to happen is you are not going to end with the you know like in this condition you are not going to stop here which means this stop codon because the point mutation it has become a sensing codon it becomes a sense codon which means your transcription will not stop at this point and the transcription is going to continue till you encounter the next stop codon till you encounter the next stop codon till the next stop it's going to continue just like that so now what is going to happen is this mrna transcription also is going to become increased and the alpha chain mrna is going to have this excess you know like uh, mrna additional mrna this is an aberrant mrna this is an additional mrna segment will be there this is an aberrant mrna segment and while it is getting translated in the ribosomes the protein that is produced also will have a aberrant protein obviously don't worry about that this exons and introns this exons will be definitely spliced and removed i mean this introns will be removed this is called post transcriptional modification this introns will be removed by splicing obviously there's no doubt about that so you are going to get only the exon only the exons you are going to get so which means so for example if you assume this is the real alpha chain protein this is the real alpha chain after removal of the introns you have only the exons that is translated into amino acids so which means this is the normal alpha chain but what happens here is here there is an excess 
alpha chain amino excess amino acids in the alpha chain that is because of the you know like uh, continuing transcription because of the stop codon mutation point between the stop codon that has changed to a sensing codon because of that you have created this additional alpha chain which is additional by usually 31 amino acids this abnormal alpha chain so this abnormal alpha chain which has that excess of 31 amino acids is what we refer to as something called a hemoglobin constant spring so this is what we refer to as something called a hemoglobin constant spring this is an aberrant amino so what is the problem in this sir there is nothing in alpha thalassemia you, i mean you can ask me in alpha thalassemia what you have told is the alpha chains will be decreased in number but this is a point mutation causing an aberrant alpha chain here there is no decline in the alpha chain production that's what you're thinking so how can it be an alpha thalassemia that's why you know like the uh, key to understanding is this long mrna this aberrant mrna if you take this long mrna or this is more than i mean this is a big chain isn't it so this is not a usual alpha chain so big chain this is an aberrant mrna alpha chain mrna is unstable is unstable in the sense not all the mrna will be transcribed translated into protein only 5 to 10 percent will survive remaining it remaining will get degraded because of the instability because it's too huge so because only 5 to 10 percent only will be translated into even i mean they produce an aberrant or abnormal alpha chain but still that is going to be translated in a very limited amount only 5 to 10 percent which means that abnormal alpha chains in this amount itself is decreased abnormal at the same time it's in this itself is decreased so this is what we refer to as it's due to point mutation it's not due to gene deletion so it's due to point mutation that is why this is something called as a non-deletional alpha thalassemia that's what we call hb constant spring for example if you ask me about hb constant spring you write hb a a this is normal so two things should be normal so then if you produce hb uh, sc for example one is a normal and another is also HBA because it's going to come in with alpha and beta. But if you write SC here, so sorry, CS here, so this becomes an HB constant spring, which means this alpha chain, I mean, sorry, uh, this is an HBA only, it contains alpha 2 and beta 2, but alpha contains this constant spring mutation, which means that is having an aberrant alpha chain. So that is why we can write as HBA constant spring. So here I am writing heterozygous. This is an example of heterozygous HB constant spring, but if I write HBA constant spring and HBA constant spring, this becomes a homozygous hemoglobin constant spring. And if I write HBA constant spring and another if I write beta, which means one is showing, one uh, on one uh, hemoglobin is showing, I mean one allele is showing a constant spring mutation in the alpha chain, another is showing a beta chain mutation. So in this condition you can write a compound heterozygous forms also so this is also possible so some examples of you know like how you can change the hemoglobin structure itself so these are some examples so depends again homo heterozygous typically comes with a thalassemia minor like picture there will be usually no problem homozygous comes with generally a thalassemia intermedia like picture which they are still there i mean here there is no clinical features of thalassemia which means that is what we call it as a minor and you, here they will have a clinical feature, but clinical features of thalassemia will be there, but there will be non transient dependent thalassemia. Here it is highly variable because common heterozygotes are generally highly variable, which means you can present with any picture depending on what is the mutation in the beta. It's a minor or minor mutation or a major mutation, all depends on that. So these are some of the important things you have to know about the alpha thalassemia. So with this. Uh, We'll wind up the alpha thalassemia, but in the next section, we are going to discuss on the uh, important aspects of the beta thalassemia and what is hemoglobin lepore and what are the variants of the hemoglobin lepore in the next section.